Uh, I'm going to talk today about silicon color centers for spin photon quantum technology. I'm not expecting everyone to be familiar with silicon color centers, but the principles should be. Uh, they're basically analogs of the diamond color centers, like nitrogen vacancy, silicon vacancy, germanium vacancy, but instead of being in diamond, they're in silicon. In particular, I want to introduce a new spin photon center. Um, that's the uh, spin photon center in this title. Uh, it's the T center. And I want to share some recent experimental results that we've had working with that center. But before we dive into the details, uh, let's begin with the end in mind. What is a scalable, deployable quantum technology going to look like? Uh, realistically, I'd put to you it's going to be solid state, and I'll argue ideally silicon. I think it's also going to operate in a telecommunications band where low loss transmission is possible, and it's going to need long quantum memory, uh, better than the channel transmission time on the order of milliseconds for terrestrial quantum communication, and thousands of times larger than qubit gate speeds, which means memory is ideally uh, at least in the milliseconds to seconds range, ideally longer. So I think it should be obvious why we need uh, memory and why telecom compatibility is desirable. But why silicon? Well, the first reason is that complementary metal oxide semiconductor fabrication is unparalleled. So the electronics capability is very good in silicon, and that won't be news to most of the audience here today. Uh, this is what made classical um, computing technology scale so rapidly, and it's also is what made uh, superconducting quantum computers uh, possible. Um, for example, from IBM and Google, they've scaled very rapidly up to sort of about 50 qubits now. But in addition to these electronic capabilities, it's also home to the most advanced photonic platform, uh, boasting low loss waveguides, efficient couplers, integrated superconducting single photon detectors that have both very high quantum efficiency, almost unit quantum efficiency, and low dark counts. Uh, it boasts low uh, loss active components like integrated modulators, as well as very high quality factor resonators. So in um, silicon photonics, people churn out uh, resonators with Qs of above, above a million routinely. What this means is that with silicon photonics, you can put an entire optical table onto a chip. The primary platform for silicon photonics is what is called silicon on insulator or SOI. And it features stacked layers of silicon and silicon oxide. Light is confined in a uh, sub micron device layer, which is sort of shown here, uh, which is on top of a buried oxide layer and can be optionally sandwiched uh, on top by another oxide layer. The capabilities of SOI allow for remote coupling of reconfigurable networks and potentially thousands of spins optically coupled on chip. So it's a really amazing uh, opportunity that we have that silicon boasts both of these capabilities. It's even luckier that in addition to those capabilities, silicon also has some of the longest coherences of any solid state platform. So I've got some um, historic uh, spin coherence achievements on this table here. Um, the record, I believe, is still currently held by CQC2T's own uh, sellers group, which achieved a uh, six hour coherence time with europium in yttrium off the silicate. Uh, but before that, the result was actually held uh, by uh, SFU uh, working in silicon with phosphorus donor nuclear spins, uh, which are those two results circled here. The longest silicon coherence times are observed in isotopically enriched silicon 28, uh, where we can get the proportion of uh, other isotopes below 50 parts per million, so astonishingly low. Uh, for example, in the material that was made for the Avogadro project redefining the kilogram. But even natural silicon is essentially a spin-free host with greater than 95% isotopic purity. So even without doing any of that complicated isotopic enrichment, uh, silicon is already a very good low spin platform for uh, quantum technologies. What that means is that there's a limited spin background to interfere with the qubit spins that you're interested in. But high isotopic purity has another advantage as well, which is that it removes mass inhomogeneity. So, uh, this means that isotopically purified silicon crystals also have very low inhomogeneous broadening for a wide variety of optical transitions. For example, I'm showing here the bound dexaton zero phonon lines uh, of a phosphorus donor, which is dramatically sharper in silicon 28 crystals. Uh, so these narrow peaks compared to the much broader natural silicon optical line. Uh, in the isotopically purified silicon, we can see that the uh, transition here is homogeneous and that we even resolve the hyperfine structure. So that would appear like a very uh, good optical transition to work with for quantum technologies. But unfortunately, the phosphorus quantum efficiency for this trans the transition, the efficiency for this phosphorus 
transition is very low, uh, less than a hundredth of a percent. Uh, so those weak inefficient transitions aren't very appealing. And for a long time, that was the common assessment of silicon for spin photon technologies, just that it long lacks strong uh, efficient emitters. But there are a couple of well-known options. So before we get to the new ones, I want to cover what's the state of the art. And when it comes to near infrared telecommunications compatible spin photon systems, rare earth ions are the main game. So I'm gonna highlight Erbium in particular uh, because it has spin selective transitions in the telecom C band. Erbium can be implanted into silicon or silicates in considerable densities uh, in this seminal work by CQC2T's uh, Rogge group. Uh, individual erbium ions were addressed optically uh, and read out electronically. Um, in this recent work from the Thompson group at Princeton, uh, they demonstrated non-destructive readout of single erbium ions, again in a silicate, uh, this time evanescently coupled to a silicon photonic uh, cavity. Um, so they were able to do single shot non-destructive readout on that platform, which is incredible. Uh, and finally, there's been even more recent work, uh, which is just reduced the line width of um, erbium ions in silicon dramatically. So I've included this uh, paper from the Risera group here, uh, but there's uh, similar group, similar research has come out of uh, CQC2T recently as well, again, from the Rogge group. Uh, so there's been remarkable progress working with erbium in the last couple of years. The other possibility I want to highlight is the chalcogens. So our team at SFU has been looking at chalcogen deep double donors uh, as another option for spin photon interfaces in silicon. I won't go into these in a lot of detail, but I've put a couple of references up there for anyone that's interested. The major drawback of this platform is that these work in a technologically challenging mid-infrared. Uh, so it means you have to work with lower efficiency detectors, more difficult sources, that kind of thing. But that's about it. There aren't a lot of choices in this space. If you want silicon, you want memory, and you want telecom, the options that you have aren't very many, uh, and they're not necessarily ideal. So we already talked about how the chalcogens are mid-infrared, but uh, Erbium as well has some drawbacks. So for example, it is a very weak optical dipole. Uh, it has an optical lifetime of about one millisecond. Um, this is also part of what gives it such, a, it's such a great coherence times. But, uh, you know, it's a problem if what you want is very strong optical coupling. Uh, in addition, it can also require very high magnetic fields, depending on the application. So it'd be nice to have some more options in this space. It'd be nice to have a bigger set of tools to work with. And uh, that's why we've been investigating some alternatives. So at SFU, we've been looking at a different type of optical emitter in silicon, um, which is called a silicon color center. Historically, it's actually called a, a silicon radiation damage center, but we want to call it a silicon color center here to highlight the similarity with the, with the diamond color centers like NV centers. The silicon color centers are called radiation damage centers because they're basically defects in the silicon lattice. They're always present, but they can be introduced by radiation. For example, radiation might displace a silicon atom from the lattice uh, to create a vacancy defect and the displaced silicon can lodge elsewhere in the lattice as an interstitial silicon defect. The radiation damage centers can be whole complexes like molecules consisting of vacancies, interstitial silicon atoms, and also chemical impurities. Uh, both carbon and oxygen are very common chemical impurities uh, for these kind of defects, and they can be naturally occurring or they can be implanted. I told you at the beginning of this talk that I was going to talk about a, a new center, but in fact, these color centers have been studied for over 50 years. The study of silicon defects is even older than the study of diamond defects. What is new is that they've only really recently been investigated as photon sources in silicon, and until the work I'm about to present, there's been almost no investigation of radiation damage centers as spin qubits. So they're new in that sense. Uh, there's a whole host of them. They're labeled alphabetically. Uh, and mo many of them are in the telecommunications band. So they're technologically appealing. I've got a spectrum here that highlights a few different uh, silicon color centers. They're easy to observe, uh, but they're not necessarily efficient emitters. So this is a uh, fluorescent spectrum from a silicon 28 sample. It's presented on a log scale. So the uh, peaks here are considerably brighter than the background luminescence, which makes up the uh, rest of this uh, spectrum that we're looking at. Uh, the known silicon color centers tend to be isoelectronic centers with bound exciton transitions. Uh, they trap and they bind traveling free exitons. Um, that means that an electron from the conduction band and a hole from the silicon valence band uh, get bound and they subsequently combine and emit light. Uh, so this sample that we're looking at, this has been irradiated with electrons to produce damage. Uh, and that's what's given us the um, uh, damage centers that we're looking at here. So, these bright lines here each correspond to lines, and I've labeled a few of them, uh, the uh, C, 
color center, the G color center, and the W color center. And I've shown their corresponding wavelengths. Now, what's interesting is that while we might expect donors like phosphorus and selenium uh, to show very narrow lines in silicon because they don't substantially per perturb the silicon lattice. The, that's not necessarily true for these silicon color centers. They're significant lattice defects by definition. Many of them have multiple chemical components. So we were very pleasantly to describe to we were very pleasantly surprised to discover that they exhibit the same dramatic inhomogeneous line width narrowing in silicon 28 as the other uh, donors that we've examined before. So let's take a close look at a few of them. We see very sharp lines, especially in silicon 28. Um, I'm going to show the uh, speculative chemical composition of the uh, centers as we go through them. Just want to highlight that the uh, composition is, is well understood, uh, but the exact structure is uh, suggested by simulation and is not 100%. Um, okay, so first of all, this is the uh, C center. Um, when we measured it in silicon 28, uh, we discovered that the line width of the C center was reduced by about a factor of 140. Uh, down to only twice the lifetime limited line width. Uh, and that actually allowed us to resolve isotopic variants of the C no phone online, which you can see here and here. The G center, which emits at about uh, 1280 nanometers, also showed dramatic, uh, dramatic narrowing, uh, which reduced this um, previously unseen and unexplained structure. Uh, so currently unexplained. And the W line isn't quite as narrow as the others, uh, but what that shows is that it's actually very sensitive to electric fields and strains, which makes it an interesting candidate for tunable on-chip light sources. Recently, several groups have been looking into the silicon color centers as emitters. So for example, in the work that I'm highlighting here, uh, W centers are used as the mechanism for a integrated LED, which is coupled on-chip with SNSPDs. Um, and they've showed some electric field tunability of that of the W emitters in that LED. But those centers that I highlighted are diamagnetic. They don't possess any spins which we can use for quantum information. There are a handful of silicon color centers that are known to be paramagnetic. Uh, and my lab, SFU, recently identified one of these, the T center, as a promising optical spin qubit. It's believed to consist of two carbon atoms and a hydrogen atom, which means that it should have one electron spin from an unpaired orbital electron and one proton spin from the hydrogen nucleus that can be uh, used as uh, spin qubits. It emits at 1326 nanometers in the telecommunications O-band by bound exciton recombination. Uh, and that's appealing because in the telecommunications O-band, very low loss photonics are available. For example, uh, optical fiber losses in that range are below 0.2 dB per kilometer, which brings uh, terrestrial quantum communication within reach. Here I'm showing uh, two types of spectra for the T center in silicon uh, 28 crystals. In blue, we have an above band spectrum where we're creating free excitons in the material with above band excitation and letting them recombine on everything that's in that material. Uh, and the orange spectrum is actually a resonantly excited uh, T spectrum. So we don't see the T zero phonon line in the spectrum because we've filtered it out uh, because it would be dominated by the excitation laser. Uh, but it does give us a very good look at the side band. And by comparing the ratios of those uh, two spectra, we're actually able to work out the debye waller factor or equivalently the no phone on emission fraction uh, for the T center, which we found to be 23%. This is good. This is a very high uh, no phone on um, emission efficiency in silicon. Um, and it's promising for uh, applications. Uh, in this diagram, we're comparing the zero phone on lines in natural and isotopically purified samples where again, blue is the natural silicon uh, and orange is the isotopically purified crystal. The isotopically purified crystal line widths are as low as 33 megahertz, uh, which is a 200 times reduction from the six gigahertz line width in natural silicon. The T center, I've talked about it in this uh, isotopic configuration here, but depending on how many of these uh, carbon 12s you replace with carbon 13s, it can actually have uh, multiple nuclear spins uh, depending on that isotopic composition. Uh, this level diagram here shows the lowest energy optical transition of the T center. The optically excited state is a bound exciton. Uh, the two electrons um, form a singlet, uh, and there is an unpaired anisotropic spin three half hole uh, in that bound exciton state. The asymmetry of the defect splits the uh, spin projections uh, of the hole into two spin doublets labeled TX0 and TX1, which are split by about 1.76 MeV. Uh, 
Uh, thermal population shifting between these two excited states causes homogeneous uh, optical broadening as a function of temperature. Uh, it's negligible at about 1.5 Kelvin. Uh, above that, it can actually be used as a thermometer. In uh, work by our two students, Laura Bergeron and Kanisha Trond, uh, which was published last year, we measured the optical lifetime of the TX naught state and found it to be 940 nanoseconds, which if the transition is sufficient, is indicative of a very strong uh, um, dipole moment of 1.5 to buy. They further went on and resolved the optical transitions between the ground spin states and the bound exciton, uh, as well as microwave and RF transitions between the electron and nuclear spin states. And those are shown in this diagram here. So the lowest of the bound exciton states, TX0, uh, splits depending on orientation because it has that anisotropic hole spin. Uh, the ground state under a magnetic field uh, also has an electron spin, which is split, and you get four optical transitions between those four levels. Uh, in addition, uh, there's a hyperfine splitting caused by the nuclear spin from the hydrogen atom, uh, and that can be resolved and addressed uh, with RF and microwave fields. So we have a complete toolkit for driving uh, transitions between these states of the system uh, and optically driving the transitions between the um, electron and hole spin states. Here I'm showing the 12 different orientational subsets of the T-center uh, showing spectra from each of the, from an ensemble as it splits under a magnetic field. So each one of these colored lines here corresponds to a single orientation. And as field increases vertically, uh, the splitting between these different orientations becomes larger and larger. Um, from this, we're able to assess that for this particular orientation of the magnetic field and the uh, crystal, that the GH, the Lambert factor uh, for the whole, is between 0 0.85 and 3.5, depending on the orientation. Because these are all optically resolved, we can pick out one distinct sub-ensemble uh, and do spin experiments with it. Um, and that's what we proceeded to do. Uh, again, depending on the isotopic composition, there are up to four spins. But in this case, we measured the electronic spin and the nuclear spin associated with the hydrogen atom. Both those spins were found to be long-lived. Uh, on this data here, I'm just showing Han echo data for those two spins. The electron lifetime was found to be 2.1 milliseconds. The nuclear lifetime, um, was found to be 0 0.28 seconds, uh, but we determined that we were actually limited in that case by magnetic field instabilities rather than by the T-center itself. Using a maximum magnitude technique that removes those magnetic field instabilities, uh, we produce the purple curve, which shows a nuclear coherence time um, of 1.1 seconds. The lifetimes, the relaxation times, uh, totally off the charts, they're at least 30 seconds for both of them, longer than we were able to measure. Okay, so that's the T-Center. Um, there's a lot of new properties which we've discovered in the last year, uh, and they're summarized here in this table. So in particular, I wanna highlight that these are very low line widths. Uh, they're within a factor of 200 of the homogeneous line width from the, of the lifetime limited line width. Uh, this is an appealing zero phonon fraction. Uh, the excited state lifetime indicates a decent uh, dipole moment, and we have nuclear and electron spin coherence times, which are more than sufficient for quantum technologies. But these were bulk measurements of silicon-28 crystals. So the next question is, can we make T in SOI wafers to take advantage of the kind of photonics toolbox that I highlighted earlier? To do that, we developed a recipe for implanting and creating T in SOI, uh, which is reported in this publication uh, at the bottom of the slide here um, by my colleague, Evan McQuarrie. Uh, the recipe is basically we implant carbon uh, with a variable dose. We rapidly thermal anneal that sample at about 1,000 degrees Celsius. Uh, then we implant hydrogen, uh, again with a variable dose, then we boil the sample for some time, uh, then we do a rapid thermal anneal at a lower temperature, uh, about 450 degrees is the optimum for creating T-centers. Um, and by, doing, by following this recipe, we're able to make concentrations in SOI, which are as high as 10 to the 13 per cubic centimeter. Uh, when we look at the photoluminescence spectra of those samples, we see that T emission from the device layer dominates the spectrum. So this is the T zero phonon line here. It's enormous compared to everything else that's going on this sample, even though we're doing above band excitation and we're actually exciting emission from the whole 700 micron chip, not just the 220 nanometer device layer. If we use a uh, uh, ultraviolet excitation, which has a penetration depth, uh, which doesn't go very far into the handle, uh, then all we see is T, you don't see anything else. Uh, so we're able to, uh, target the creation of T and uh, make 
appreciable concentrations of T without making any undesirable uh, radiation damage centers. Um, we're able to observe isotopic shifts. Uh, so having zooming in on the spectra of two samples here, uh, they're labeled irradiated and implanted. Um, what that really means, the irradiated sample is only using natural carbon. So that's a natural uh, carbon isotopic distribution. The implanted distribution, we've decided to implant carbon-13 to give us more nuclear spins to play with. Uh, and we can resolve the isotopic shift there. The alignments that we measure are about six gigahertz uh, in float zone silicon and 30 gigahertz in commercial grade SOI wafer. So that's it for the inhomogeneous distribution of the implanted T centers. What is the homogeneous uh, line width like? Uh, how much does spectral diffusion contribute to that line width? Uh, we've answered that question by uh, a technique in which we excite the center of the uh, T distribution resonantly, and then we the magnetic field strength up uh, progressively. And as we do that, we split those four field dependent optical transitions that, that I highlighted earlier, and the overlap between those tr transition goes down. So there's a point where they're all uh, degenerate and you drive every transition equally and you get uh, fl continuous fluorescence. Uh, but then as you increase the field, the overlap diminishes. So you're driving the transitions less and less efficiently. And then eventually you're not driving them at all. You're effectively in a dark state and you don't get any continuous fluorescence. And the field that's necessary to achieve that basically tells you how large the line width uh, of those transitions is. So how large the homogeneous line width is. We've performed that measurement on a number of samples and I'm just gonna quickly uh, highlight the results for you here. So with uh, isotopically purified silicon at 1.4 Kelvin, we measure uh, homogeneous line widths uh, labeled gamma SD for spectral diffusion of about 27 megahertz. Uh, for natural silicon, um, we measure line widths of about 16 megahertz. In SOI, it's significantly larger. In SOI, we're measuring um, spectral diffusion line widths of about one gigahertz. Uh, and then as we increase the implant density, the implant dose, and we damage the crystal more, we see even higher um, spectral diffusion line widths. So these are quite large spectral diffusions in SOI. But these measurements were performed on billions of centers simultaneously. Up until now, everything I've shown you is a bulk measurement. Uh, but obviously for many quantum devices, what we want to be able to do is to isolate and control a single qubit at a time. Uh, so to isolate a single T-center, my student Alex, uh, who's shown here, and, uh, and I, this is me, um, from before uh, COVID lockdowns, uh, we built a cryogenic microscope system with a focal spot size of one micron so that a single center could be isolated in the focus at a time. Microscopy of silicon emitters is challenging. Uh, the reason for that is simply that the high refractive index of silicon traps light inside the sample by total internal reflection, so that you have a very low collection efficiency from the sample uh, compared to diamond, for example. Uh, here I'm showing the uh, total intensity collected by a lens with a numeric aperture of 0.7 as a function of wavelength. You can see that it's always less than a percent. This is the best that you can do if you're collecting directly from a bulk silicon sample. Combined with how uh, dim some of these emitters are, uh, so the T-Center, for example, we've measured an optical lifetime of about a microsecond. Uh, that means that we're expecting for resonant excitation at most about 500,000 uh, counts a second. That's before all of our losses. So that's relatively dim compared to something like the MV center uh, So combined with that dimness, these uh, the higher effective index of silicon poses a real challenge uh, in, in order to get measurable count rates. I do want to emphasize, though, that this is a feature, not a bug. Uh, low escape efficiency is exactly what you want for integrated devices. You want to capture the light inside waveguides on, in the plane of the chip and not lose it vertically. So although this makes it challenging for confocal microscopy, it is exactly what you want as you uh, move towards that um, you know, fully integrated chip system where everything's waveguide coupled. But because it is challenging, uh, single defects in silicon were only identified by microscope for the first time last year. Uh, so first with the G center, which is the result that I've gone here, uh, subsequently with the T results that I'm about to show, uh, and then uh, it has been uh, demonstrated again with the W center uh, in this paper here. Of the three, I'll highlight that T is definitely the more, most challenging and has significantly longer optical lifetimes than the other two. Uh, so the count rates are much lower. To improve the collection efficiency over bulk silicon, to make this a feasible experiment, we designed silicon photonic nanostructures that we call micropucks. These are 
Very simple. They couldn't be simpler. They're small disks of silicon sitting on a thick silicon oxide substrate. So if you remember that side diagram of SOI that I showed earlier, this is what it looks like. Uh, you've got a thin um, silicon device layer, you've got an oxide box, and you've got an oxide cladding layer, which is optional. Uh, for our pucks, all we do is we etch away most of the device layer, leaving only a disk uh, behind. So the disk height is equal to the thickness of the device layer, and from above, they're just circles. So here is an optical image uh, of a block of pucks, which uh, we fabricated for this purpose. Uh, they're fabricated by electron beam lithography, so the uh, puck size can be very small, can be submicron. Um, and according to simulation, uh, these structures give you a large increase in collection efficiency from a dipole um, at the puck center. There's two mechanisms that are contributing to that. One is that there is a very small Purcell effect. These things are basically uh, very weak cavities. Uh, the Purcell effect is limited to about a factor of three or four, uh, but it's there and it helps. Um, the other thing that they do is they just redirect the light. They're essentially focusing the light upwards into your lens. And that's clear in this uh, image here, which is showing the uh, electric field, so the intensity actually, uh, as a, um, you know, as a function of position in space. Uh, as you can see for the emitter inside just a regular SOI layer, uh, most of the light is trapped within the device layer, again, which is by design. Uh, and very little of the light actually escapes up into the uh, lens acceptance aperture, which I've shown here with dashed lines. But when you go to the uh, micro puck, first of all, you see that everything is brighter. That's the Purcell effect uh, increasing the emission rate of the source. Uh, but the second thing you see is that even proportionally, more of the light is directed upwards. There is no device layer for it to be trapped in. Uh, and depending on the size of the micro puck that you choose, you get more or less light directed upwards uh, into your uh, cone of acceptance for your lens. So at the end of the day, uh, what that means is that we expect about 20 times more signal from a center in a puck than a center in bare silicon. So we fabricated about 100,000 micro pucks on a single chip, uh, and we cooled it down in a uh, closed cycle cryostat um, at CS100 from Montana. Uh, it's mounted on a couple of nano positioners so that we can move the sample around inside the cryostat. Uh, we also have nano positioners outside of the cryostat that we can move the objective back and forth. And they're actually more stable. They can give us um, uh, excellent position, uh, precision. Um, and then we collect light into our microscope uh, and send that to a detector. And we can record our fluorescence rate as a function of position over the chip. So we scan the microscope to image an array of pucks. Uh, and we get images that look like this. We're measuring about 2,500 counts a second for the very brightest pucks. Uh, we're filtering the fluorescence in this case. We're filtering for the T sideband. Uh, we're doing that so that ultimately we can excite these resonantly and again measure the fluorescence on the sideband. There's a very strong dependence on puck radius uh, with brightness here, which corresponds to what we'd expect from the model I talked about earlier, which is just a dipole at the center of a uh, puck emitting on the T spectrum, uh, which we know from the bulk studies. And it, so the simulated pattern uh, as a function of radius and wavelength looks a bit like this. Uh, and when we measure actual pucks, we see something that corresponds. Once we've imaged an array of pucks, we can position over a single puck uh, and we can proceed to uh, measure the spectrum of that puck in particular. Um, and when we do that, we see not only T, which was present in the uh, original material before we patented it, we also see G, and that's introduced by the electron lithography. Uh, so we have the T peak here and the G peak here. Uh, in addition, we also see an enhancement depending on puck radius we see a peak appearing in the sideband of the T and G centers, which corresponds to the band of enhancement from the micropuck. So by tuning the micropuck radius, we can pick where we want this enhancement band to be. Now for resonant excitation, what we're interested in doing is exciting T resonantly and collecting on the sideband. So we actually want a puck radius, which doesn't necessarily enhance the T no phone online, but does enhance the T sideband within the range of our detectors. So for that reason, we pick a radius of about 305 nanometers. Uh, and we have uh, whole blocks of 305 nanometer radius pucks on this chip. Uh, and we can measure them with resonant excitation and see if we can observe any T centers. When we scan our resonant laser over the pucks, we see spectra that look like this, where we see these uh, sharp peaks sparsely scattered uh, over a range, which is a little bit larger than the inhomogeneous line shown by this black line of the material before patterning. So we have increased the inhomogeneous distribution a little bit 
uh, by patterning these micropucks, which is probably in phase of X. Um, after accounting for measured losses, the count rate for our brighter centers is about 2.1 kilocounts per second. Compared to the ideal uh, count rate, the ideal emission rate of the um, T center that I talked about earlier, and compared to the maximum enhancement we could possibly get from theory for these micropucks, that equates to about a 3% quantum efficiency. Now that's not very good, but I do want to stress that that's a 3% efficiency from quantified nodes. So we're assuming that every center that we're looking at is optimally positioned, is optimally coupled to a puck which performs the best we could possibly simulate. Uh, and we're only subtracting uh, the losses which we were able to measure and quantify. There are known losses which we haven't quantified, which also exist on that. And if you make uh, you know, our best guess estimates for what those known unknowns are, uh, then we get closer to a 10% quantum efficiency. Um, according to the theory, we actually expect it to be about 100%, um, you know, basically unit quantum efficiency, because there aren't many mechanisms that can account for uh, the decrease. So for example, we believe we've eliminated the LJ process as a candidate uh, with um, not measured any sample conductivity changes as a function of excitation. So with that mechanism eliminated, there is some reason to expect these to be uh, unit quantum efficiency. I think we've got a lower bound of about 10%, definitely 3%, uh, and we have some circumstantial evidence that actually it is closer to unity, uh, but we're not making any strong claims about that for the time being. That's a detail that we need to pin down further. Uh, we can take a histogram of the lines which we observe under this resonant excitation, uh, and we can see how the distribution of these corresponds to the distribution of, of the uh, T in the original ensemble. So again, this black line is the inhomogeneous distribution uh, that we had before patterning, uh, and these green histograms show the measured uh, T resonances uh, from a block of uh, 305 nanometer pucks. So we're measuring uh, 144 pucks, uh, and we get a mean center per puck of about one. Um, when we look at the line widths that we observe, uh, we can see that they're close to the characteristic dif uh, spectral diffusion of the material which we measured earlier. Um, for this sample, we're not actually uh, at 1.5 Kelvin. Our cryostat's limited uh, to about four Kelvin. Uh, so we have a thermal bound on the temperature, which is actually about 255 megahertz. That's given by the excitation between those TX north and those TX1 states that I talked about earlier. Uh, because these are also fairly weak emitters, we're driving them hard to get a lot of counts a second. We want them to be near saturation. That means that we're also getting a lot of power broadening on these measurements. So taking the thermal bound and the power broadening into account, we think we have a minimum line width that we could possibly measure of about 361 megahertz. What we actually measure is closer to one gigahertz. Uh, which is the black line that's shown here. It's about 1.4 gigahertz. Uh, that actually corresponds very precisely to the spectral diffusion that we measured in combination with the thermal and power broadening mechanisms. Uh, the narrowest one that we measure has a line width of 660 megahertz, which is actually pretty promising. That means that for some of these centers, spectral diffusion is 400 megahertz or lower. Uh, once we've identified uh, these resonances, we can measure the optical lifetime. Uh, and when we do that, we find an optical lifetime that's actually a little bit lower than what we measured in bulk. Uh, so we have, an ex we have a uh, lifetime here of about 800 nanoseconds down from 940 nanoseconds. That lifetime reduction factor is a factor of 1.17 uh, from the spectrally weighted puck uh, per cell simulations. We would expect a lifetime reduction factor of 1.15. So these are tantalizingly close, but we can't uh, be sure that this is a per cell effect at this point. We also expect that strain is going to mix the TX north and the TX1 levels, and that is also a mechanism that could give you a lifetime reduction. It's not well understood, so I can't, I can't rule that out, uh, but we do measure a lifetime reduction. We can, of course, look at that fluorescence and we can do an autocorrelation measurement in a Hanby Brown and Twist configuration, uh, from which we can conclude that these are single centers. Um, once we do the background subtraction, we see that there's a dip below 0.5. Uh, and from that, we can be confident that these single lines that we're looking at look so promisingly like single centers really are. But what about qubit states? Well, if we apply a small magnetic field to separate the electron spin qubit states of a T center, uh, we can uh, see two color resonances corresponding to uh, those two, the optical transitions between those two electron states and the split whole states uh, shown here. When we look at an individual center scanning two laser energies, if there's no splitting, then we see basically no correlation. We see the same resonance irrespective of the position of the other laser. 
But for some centers, what we see is actually that there are spatially separated uh, um, bright spots on this two color excitation map. And those correspond to uh, two color resonances where we have one laser addressing the spin up electron state and one laser addressing the spin down uh, electron state. Uh, and you have to have both of them on so that you don't end up in a dark state and you get continuous fluorescence. Uh, with that, we're basically able to map out our electron spin states. And I've got this figure here, which is uh, just showing that after we recently upgraded from APDs to SNSPDs, we're getting uh, a factor of five higher uh, collection efficiencies and we're able to take some really uh, higher SNR measurements. But just picking out one of these centers to look at, uh, the bright spots on the spectrum correspond to different combinations of the spin dependent transitions shown here, A, B, C, and D. We can resolve all four of those spin dependent transitions. Uh, another way to illustrate this is to uh, fix one laser and scan the other in pump probe spectroscopy. So for example, if we do that on the same center, if we scan just a single laser, we see some fluorescence here, which corresponds to the overlap of the central transitions, the B and C transitions. If we instead fix the pump laser, on transition B, for example, then we get fluorescence when the uh, probe laser scans over the A uh, and C transitions. Uh, so when we have it on B corresponding to the spin, uh, so addressing the spin down state, we see resonances when we have our probe laser addressing the spin up state. What we're basically doing here is initializing and reading out a single electron spin in silicon, which to our knowledge has never been done all optically before this result. We're further able to fit a master equation with a four-level Hamiltonian that matches this data very closely. But where is all of this going? Well, an optical spin photon interface in silicon is ideally going to take advantage of silicon photonics. And that means that we're not going to work with pucks and microscopy. We want to integrate it with waveguides like these kind of devices so that we can uh, have it in high Q resonators and coupled to uh, on-chip detectors. If you can do that, then you can build an on-chip spin photon network, which is capable of doing some quantum computational operations. For example, here I'm showing a schematic of a uh, optical quantum circuit for photonically coupled spins, which is a stabilizer circuit. So this is a, an error correcting circuit where you continuously measure the emission from these centers uh, and preserve the qubit states. In order to do that, we need T and waveguides. Very quickly, going to show some uh, new results showing that we uh, have integrated T into waveguides. We're measuring very bright ensembles. Uh, this is work by my students, Adam and Camille Bonus. Uh, we can resonantly excite the uh, T centers in waveguides, and we see no reduction, and we see no increase in line width uh, for the T ensembles in waveguides compared to the unpatterned T ensemble of the material. So that's very promising. The additional interface doesn't broaden the ensemble measurably. Ultimately, the goal is for us to have T centers in cavities uh, in the strong coupling regime, uh, which make that kind of non-demolition uh, non measurement uh, that I talked about earlier possible. We're in, currently in the process of characterizing SOI wafers uh, with cavities for that purpose and SOI wafers with those cavities uh, and the integrated T. So watch this space. We look forward to having some results there very shortly. So in conclusion, what have I talked about? I've talked about emissive defects in silicon, uh, namely the silicon color centers. Talked about results with C, G, and W showing how they can be very narrow line width in silicon 28 and how they can make promising integrated photon sources. I've also talked about T. Uh, which is an O-band emitter with long-lived spins, uh, has telecoms, spin photon uh, properties that make it very appealing for quantum devices. Uh, and ultimately, what we're going to do with that is move towards photon-mediated spin-spin entanglement on chip. The particular results that I wanted to highlight are with integrated T-centers with silicon photonics, with isolated and measured single T-centers, with optically resolved the electron spin states, We've done the first all optical detection of a single spin in silicon, uh, and we've further demonstrated integration with waveguides, which is the next step to useful circuits. So thank you for listening to my talk. Uh, I want to thank everyone that's in this photo because obviously the work that I presented is the work of a big team. Lots of people have put into this, in particular, the leader of our group, Steph Simmons, uh, our professor emeritus, Mike, uh, who founded the group and is still a big part of our day-to-day -day operations. Um, and students, uh, Alex Kirkjian, who worked with me on the confocal microscopy, uh, Laurent and Camille, uh, who did the uh, Silicon 28 work, and uh, my student Camille and Adam, who are working on the waveguide integrated and cavity integrated T centers. Uh, this is what SFU looks like for those of you that haven't had the chance to visit. Uh, so please, if you haven't, do come visit us. And also, of course, we have uh, lots of opportunities for PhD students and postdocs available.
So you're welcome to uh, let us know if you're interested and come work with us. Uh, even if you're not an experimentalist, there's a new uh, Quantum Algorithms Institute uh, opening up at SFU. So there are going to be some opportunities in that space as well. Thank you.